Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for uh, this evening's Tertiary Masterclass. My name is Andrew Atchison, and I'm the artist educator at the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art. I'm wearing a red corduroy shirt, and there is a cabinet in my background, and I'm zooming in this evening from my living room. Before we begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to extend my respects and gratitude to elders past, present and emerging. Tonight, we are privileged to be joined by Mikna Merkan, <clears throat> excuse me, curator of the current ACA exhibition, A Biography of Daphne. This evening, Mikna will present a response to the exhibition in the form of a kind of virtual roving tour through ACA's galleries, followed by an audience led Q&A session. This event is an opportunity to learn about the critical strategies and philosophy of practice deployed by Mikna through the process of developing this major curatorial project within the institutional structure of a practice-led curatorial PhD. Mikna Merkan is a curator, writer, and PhD candidate in curatorial practice at MADA, Monash University, Melbourne. He was artistic director of Extra City Kunsthal, Antwerp, between 2011 and 2015, and curated, among others, a slowdown of the museum, one-to-one, -one, Hans van Howelingen and Jonas Stahl, the series Cross Examinations, and Jean-Luc Moulin Endwoods. His most recent exhibition, A Biography of Daphne, is currently on view at ACCA and was developed as part of his PhD candidature. A Biography of Daphne is a curatorial project that revisits the classical myth of Daphne as the starting point for an investigation into trauma and metamorphosis, symbiosis and entanglement in contemporary art. This event will be recorded for release as a video on ACCA's website, and we will have a Q&A session towards the end. Please submit your questions via the Q&A tab, and we will try to answer as many as possible, time permitting. And with that, I will hand over to you, Mikna. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andrew, for the, for the kind introduction. Um, I do wish to acknowledge the Kulin Nations as the as the sovereign custodians of the land that I work on. Um, I want to thank warmly ACA for organizing this talk to you, Andrew, and to Bianca. Um, also thank ACA for the, um, for the generosity and the intelligence with which they have um, supported my, my exhibition. Um, thank you all. Um, I can't see you, unfortunately, but thanks so much for your, for your presence. And I very much regret that our meeting happens in the effective abyss of Zoom rather than in the galleries, in the in the presence of the works that participating artists have so um, generously contributed to the exhibition. Um, in the next hour or so, I will um, I will introduce, as, as Andrew indicated, some of the questions that, that underpin the exhibition, a biography of Daphne, um, a few works that respond to or complicate those questions uh, and that have been crucial to my uh, evolving understanding of metamorphosis, of the ways in which a trans transformation becomes an image. But I will start um, with, a, with a biographical detour, with a biographical anecdote, which will ultimately connect to Apollo and Daphne, uh, to, the, to the myth, perhaps indirectly. Um, and um, this uh, an anecdote which describes the moment when my curatorial practice embraced anachronism quite willingly and uh, a preoccupation with speculative genealogies, attending to uh, or reimagining some of the histories from which fraught notions and figures in the present descend. I began work as a curator in Romania in 2004. At the time, at the time when uh, the difficulties of the country's still ongoing transition to democracy after many decades of brutal communist rule seemed to embody primarily in monumental forms, the destructions of symbols of the past with strangely, photo strangely photogenic toppled monuments as indexes of upheaval or renewal, the central objects in media representations of political change, but also the accelerated fabrication of new memorial signs new monumental simplifications of social transformations. Those debates revolved primarily around the commemoration of the 1989 revolution, recasting those who had lost their lives in the anti-communist insurrection as martyrs.
designated precisely those who were commissioning the monument to martyr them. As you might um, know, given the, the prominence in the art world um, through many exhibitions of, um, of the video, um, collaboratively direct, directed by Harun Paroki and Andrei Ujiko, videograms of a revolution. The Romanian revolution is a profoundly enigmatic historical object in spite of, or maybe precisely because of its televisual transparency, of the fact that it was continuously televised and broadcast, beamed back to those who were performing it. So in the lingo of the 90s, when this was happening, this overabundant footage seems to aggregate as a plethora of making of features published on a DVD that includes no director's cut and no coherent narrative of those events. I imagine that it was my responsibility as a curator to engage polemically with those murky transactions between orders of representation, the abrupt shifts between political calculation and the transcendent horizon, interrupted biography and apocryphal hagiography. I will now start sharing my screen and I hope um, it will be perfectly visible to all. The image you're seeing um, is a collective project uh, made by artists, part artists participating to a show in Bucharest um, where the then recently inaugurated monument for the Romanian revolution, which you can see in the back in the, in the background of the image was digitally inserted into a photograph of precisely the events that it commemorated, indicated, indicating in its simultaneity, simultaneity with those events a shared the resolution. Subsequent projects looked at the conditions of the monument in a post-communist context at a time when ideas of collectivity, the metaphysical us of commemorative belonging were being radically altered. And when the metaphor of Europe and the administrative reach of the European Union were expanding following the collapse of the Iron Curtain. Those projects were increasingly premised on an interrogation of precedence to such monumental struggles and dilemmas. Um, interested in histories of dramatic conflict between effigies and ideologies. And I encountered one such precedent during a trip to Rome. And this is Lauretti, Tommaso Lauretti's triumph of Christianity over the pagan idol, which includes a very different portrait of Apollo than the one which is not far away at the Borghese Gallery. So this is at the Vatican, the Borghese Gallery, uh, also in Rome, um, features among other remarkable exhibits, Bernini's representation of the Apollo and Daphne myth. Um, Apollo appears, as I indicated, as a very different kind of character here. Rather than originator of the event, Apollo is presented here as a mass of marble, which registers in its disintegration the force of an apparition, the arrival of the future. Um, you have to imagine that this spreads uh, across the ceiling, which is, um, if I recall correctly, about 15 meters wide um, of a um, pretty impressive hall um, at, at the Vatican. So the the fresco was made in 1589 um, and spreads across the ceiling of the whole of Constantine in the, in the Vatican. Its two actors never cease to appear to one another, to play themselves as opposed and inseparable, as static and mobile, and as, as emergence and as ruination. Absence has accelerated into immediacy, and the atmospheric pressure of this mutation has made marble give way. The sudden advent of the crucifix, which is perched on a pedestal, has pulverized the previous inhabitant of that uh, of that uh, pedestal, um, the, sta uh, the statue of Apollo, uh, but it has not compromised its recognizability. Made after the Council of Trent as a visual manifesto of the Counter-Reformation, but also in response to the prolix nudes in Michelangelo's nearby uh, Sistine Chapel, Lauretti's painting laconically dramatizes a historical occurrence. Emperor Constantine's decision to replace pagan imagery with Christian emblems and thus ensure the iconographic consolidation of the empire. History appears here as both material demonstrable and unfolding at an imperceptible remove. Discovering this, works, this work where distinct sets of belief and visual paradigms are pitted against one another in a vertiginous relationship was something of an epiphany for me which over time rearticulated the context of my curatorial investigations as oscillations between pasts and futures, survivals and falls into time, as compositions of perspectival axes and timelines. I want to fast forward now to a project that is in many ways a precursor to a biography of Daphne. Uh, in 2013, I was working at Extra City Kunsthal in Antwerp in Belgium, and I curated a project titled Allegory of the Cave Painting, 
whose point of departure was a study published uh, two years before in the Journal of Antiquity by Professor Jack Pettigrew of Queensland University. Pettigrew proposed a solution to the notorious problem of dating the Guion Guion paintings in the Kimberley in Northwestern Australia, which are assumed to be very old with estimates ranging between 15 and 46,000 years. Yet when some of these images are dated with conventional archeological protocols, the results sometimes suggest that the paintings are very recent. Professor Pettigrew proposes that both dates are correct, that the paintings exist precisely in the space between a remarkable longevity and a radical contemporaneity, as the original pigment contains spores and activators that have over time turned these images into colonies of microorganisms where a fungus is symbiotic with the cyanobacteria. These two microorganisms exchange carbohydrates and water, cannibalize on their predecessors and rejuvenate in situ, maintaining the paintings in a state of permanent self-painting of reproduction and conservation. So these paintings are in a sense their own museum and they have withstood abrupt shifts of temperature and humidity over millennia. They have also been carving their position or framing themselves deeper and deeper into the rock so that the colony rarely leaves the contours of art because the bacteria releases a weak acid in its photosynthesis, which eats into the quartz wall, etching the paintings into an inanimated permanence. The custodians of, the, of, of these paintings, the Ngarin nation of the Kimberley, say that the Guion Guion paintings were made by a bird the cushion, striking its beak against the rock with such force or ferocity that blood gushes out of it, and then using either the beak or a feather to coax the trickling pigment into, into the sophisticated morphology of these works. I was struck by the fact that ancestral story and scientific hypotheses converge in suggesting that there is blood coursing through the veins of these paintings, an intersection of old knowledge and new technology which is one of the dialectical tensions that seem to propel the life or idiosyncratic ecology of images and signification of the Guion Guion paintings. They were a mental model for the project, established as a pretext at the entrance to the exhibition via documents and the modicum of scientific data, and then recurring allegorically, resonating through the various intervals that the exhibition explored between art and life, indistinguishable in this case, which seems to reenact or replay the myth of Pygmalion with abstract and organic protagonists, but also gaps between trace and volume, painting and sculpture, deep past and modernity, all the new ways of making sense of things, bacterial and human colonies. In, a, in later articles, Professor Pettigrew ventured a further hypothesis, according to which one of the ritual roles of these paintings might be associated with a cult of the Bobab tree. The authors of the paintings may have traveled from what is today South Africa in boats carved out of tree trunks while the seeds provided sustenance along the journey so that the tree propelled them in space and time. The remaining seeds were planted upon arrival and the tree became a devotional presence in the life of the tribe, which might explain what Pettigrew describes as a morphing of human and vegetal anatomies in paintings such as the one on your screens where limbs begin to resemble the branches that they might become. Beyond all other elements which differentiate them from other instances of rock art, the absence of the animal in these paintings, the animal which is conventionally understood as the leverage point which sustains the arc of becoming human via opposition, is another striking fact, suggesting that a version of humanity emerges from this space of vegetal intimacy or symbiosis, physical and imaginary, with the tree. Beyond this superficial analogy to Daphne's vegetal metamorphosis, the two projects communicate for me via rhythm and synchronicity. The Guion Guion's perpetual self-contained replenishment, a permanent process of becoming contemporaneous, and Daphne's becoming contemporary, the historical transformation of her images of, of the historical transformation of images of her transformation, the endless reanimation of her trauma of her paradoxical conflation of subjection and resistance, violation and purity, defeat and triumph across epochs of art history. You probably know the, the story, um, Daphne's story, which begins with a competition between gods. Um, following a contest with Apollo, Cupid seeks to demonstrate his superiority by, to the god of the sun by shooting the myths uh, protagonist with two arrows of opposite effect. Apollo is consumed by desire for Daphne, while she, having resolved to remain a virgin, 
flees him in repulsion. At the moment of imminent cap capture, Daphne pleads with her father, the river god Aeneas, to be saved. Destroy the form that has caused this passion, she exclaims. Daphne is transformed into the tree that in Greek bears her name, the laurel. Defeated, Apollo claims the tree as his emblem, as part of the rituals of prognostication as his temp at his temples, and fashion his crown, the crown worn by all laureates, since from a branch of Daphne's new body, which still recoils from his touch. The image you're seeing is a painting by Polaiolo at the National Gallery. The story is uh, much older than uh, classical Latin poetry, but Ovid's Metamorphosis is its first cogent telling, and an enormously successful one in terms of the very rich visual posterity it's had, Daphne's myth being perhaps more frequently revisited than any other story of violent transformation narrated there. The Metamorphosis is an opus in 15 books about transformation in Greek and Roman mythologies, completed in the year eight during Ovid's exile at Tomis, currently Constanza in Romania, at the eastern frontier of the Roman Empire. The poem integrates 250 myths in a complete history of the world, from its creation to the death and apotheosis of Julius Caesar. Myths conjoin in a shape-shifting universe where all beings share a primal substrate of matter. One form turning into another is an exposition of their fundamental affinity, of their co-implication in a cosmos where no entity precedes, the sets of relations that it brings into being. The poem is an uninterrupted cycle of this and re-embodiments, a vortex of mutable shapes that unites gods, demigods, and mortals as they become plants or animals, rivers and stones, as temporary personifications of passion and defenselessness, aggression and endurance, change in its permanence. A procession of bodies in constant danger of being overcome and disfigured by the chaos they can barely contain. Proceeding from this primordial magma, Daphne is an ekphrastic being, a cyborg of text and image, skin and bark, whose biography extends from Ovid's medieval commentators and illustrators all the way to moments of ekphrastic transfer in modern art, such as perhaps Sylvia Platt's uh, response celebrated response to a Paul Clay etching uh, titled Virgin in a Tree, one of myriad examples of Daphne's re-emergence in, in modern art. Medieval illust illuminations called, uh, called Daphne, recast Daphne as a, as a model of, of Christian chastity, um, while in the Renaissance, she is uh, an enigmatic apparition arising at the threshold between figure and landscape. Um, the, I apologize, the, the previous image is by Palumba, and this is Tintoretto in Modena at the Stanza Gallery. Um, corner is the booth. Uh, Baroque artists compose an inventory of almost serial permutations of expo exposure and repulsion, variations of the dramatic contraposto of disuniting pursuer and prey, anguished flight and paralysis. Beyond the preoccupation with the plasticity and spectacle of metamorphosis, what unites these otherwise distinct examples of engagement with the myth is a chronological operation. The story is in a sense endlessly updated, retold against a contemporaneous backdrop. Artists gravitate to Daphne's paradoxes at, the time, at times when her convulsively interlocked bodies seem able to capture the interplay between crisis and survival, personhood and anonymity in each epoch's imagination of the centripetal tensions that structure the self and its centrifugal dispersal in a perilous perilous world. Like Ovid's telescopic passage from Genesis from the creation of the world to his present, and like the long sequence of revisions that the myth undergoes in art history, the exhibition at Aka too aims to create an expanded contemporary landscape around Daphne's becoming, teasing out a dialogue between her biography and some of the narratives that shape present day, present day notions of transformation and identity. Ciprian Mureșan's drawing made especially for the exhibition juxtaposes and superposes about 130 representations from the Middle Ages, the Renaissance and the Baroque of Daphne's metamorphosis um, called from the online archive of the Warburg Institute in London, um, which are copied in pencil drawings that respect the size of their display on the artist's computer screen. Like pages seemingly disordered by a sudden gust of wind, the reproductions compose a palimpsest 
where differences and similarities are camouflaged, a body becoming a tree, hiding behind the body becoming a tree in a spectral volume. A many-limbed identity crosses repeatedly an ontological threshold as it emerges from and recedes into uh, the scene of its own continuous creation and destruction, with each reproduction a snapshot from this palindromic movement from opacity to recognizability, from line of flight to build up of graphite, like a montage of fade-ins and fade-outs. The title of the exhibition frames biography, Daphne's biography, as a point of inflection between different lives, between, between uh, a human anatomy and the vegetal one. Uh, the ruptures and convergences that appear between the myths, between the myth on the one hand and on the other, its contemporary correlates or extrapolations, the always and nowhere of Daphne's story and the here and now of the exhibition. Asking myself about the kinds of images that hemorrhage from these wounds, wounds on bodies, on timelines, and within allegorical mechanisms, I structured the exhibition around three vectors of transformation, of which becoming contemporary, which I already mentioned, is one. Rather than intersect um, as pers perspective lines would at the vanishing point of an achieved transformation, these vectors coil and twine to mark a fractured geometry of the visual field as an equivalent for the broken syntax of the transformed body, which is dismembered and remembered continuously. If metamorphosis is not taken as a linear continuous process, but rather as a spinning matrix of causes and effects of movements without leverage points, as the granular maximalism of infinite changes and readjustments between corporeal and spatial templates, and as a figural drama which is played out not so much in a specific place, but rather between the incommensurate orders which it must reconcile. Then these vectors of transformation stem from the question what precisely changes in Daphne's metamorphosis. One such vector is, of course, her becoming three, a project that a process that the project visualizes as perpetually incomplete, as never, never concluded. Throughout the exhibition, references to this stunted emergence of the tree through the body appear in works by Jean-Luc Moulin, Candice Lynn and P. Staff, Mono Bataman and Florin Tudor as eruptions or exclamatory prefigurations of the vegetal, which are countered, uprooted or metabolized in the diffuse ecology of natures and cultures, forests and gardens, bodies and places. I wanted to speak about another illustration of this curtailed vegetal metamorphosis, which is one of the essential operations of the show as well. Um, we, a show which insists on the space which is formed in the overlap between, um, let's say, a postscript to a body uh, and a prelude to a tree. Um, so there's a connection that, that forms, which I'm going to try to rehearse via Zoom. It's, it's probably uh, slightly more evident and slightly more palpable in the, in the space. There's a connection that, that forms between uh, what I would describe as the first and the last image of, of the show. Um, two images are installed back to back on two sides of the same, of the same wall uh, in gallery one and gallery two. And they dramatize the Daphne's accelerated entry into the exhibition and her arborescent exit from it. Uh, the extension of her tendrils that stem from her fingers beyond the edges of the exhibition. The image you're looking at is Anthony Waterloo's um, Apollo and Daphne, um, an, an etching from 1650 uh, on loan from the NGV, um, which is a highly unusual representation of the myth. Um, unusual because Daphne here is still autonomous. She's um, she's fleeing, um, she's fleeing Apollo in repulsion. Um, and as I mentioned, this is the first work that, that visitors to the exhibition encounter. The last work that they see is Agostino de Musi's um, representation of the myth Apollo and Daphne on loan from the art gallery of New South Wales, um, where um, the moment of capture is represented. Um, and de Musi shows Daphne eluding Apollo by becoming a laurel tree. So these two images, um, the flight and the capture, plus the escape, the vegetal escape, um, bracket the, these two images bracket the chronological horizon of the exhibition, um, which is compressed between these two, two scenes, which in the myth are only a few seconds apart. So this, this agonic interval, agonizing interval between the first and the last image is um, only a few seconds long in the, in the myth, uh, we, could, we could imagine, and it is stretched and warped in order to accommodate the various timelines um, in, in the show. 
the various timelines that are mobilized by the works in, in the show. Um, Deimus's Daphne seems to disentangle herself not only from Apollo's embrace, but also to evade the very space of the engraving, of her two crossed hands becoming branches, the left one gestures out of frame, invisibly pointing with its new leaves fluttering in the wind without origin of the metamorphosis, away from both exhibition and gallery, to other transformed environments and to the metamorphic beings that endure within them. Returning to the first image, the water law etching, it also sets into motion um, another, the third axis that structures the exhibition, uh, which I uh, refer to as becoming image. Daphne's becoming image is an abrupt transition between modes of orienting and delineating the scene between distinct perceptual and technical formats. It's essentially a switch from portrait to landscape, perhaps the oxymoron of a landscape portrait, portrait where a vertical and dynamic presence dissolves in a scene without characters and our imaginary telescope onto that scene readjusts in the aftermath of her sudden disappearance. The figure is engulfed by the ground, the portrait vanishes as the girl vanishes in Margaret Atwood's uh, short story entitled Death by Landscape. Ways of picturing Daphne's transformation as a visual event are reversed in the attempt to imagine what and how Daphne sees, how we, how we ourselves might appear to her as terrified and terrifying onlookers. From Daphne's own perspective, the transition from portrait to landscape, from her agi agitated um, presence and then flight from Apollo to her disappearance into the forest as part of the forest, uh, so the transition from portrait to landscape might be replicated in a shift from a truncated, encumbered viewpoint to a panorama, from seeing almost nothing, which is the forest that dances violently around her as she flees Apollo in this image, um, it's a, which the, the, the violence of the scene is a segue from the, for this mental representation of what Daphne might be seeing as her metamorphosis is underway. A transition to being immobilized at the center of an open space, exposed and paralyzed, unable to find her bearings apart from the static point to which her roots tether her. Daphne is immobilized at the center of a panorama. Her fiction is fixed in an experience of vertigo. Paralyzed within the landscape that resulted from her own expulsion and reinscription into it, the previously impaired viewpoint of the chase now bleeds into its surrounds, into the forest's final halt into a world in which the subject no longer moves, but which itself pivots around the subject. The static free fall is twice dramatized in the show by two arcs. One such arc runs from the first gallery, ac runs across the first gallery from this work to the end of uh, the, the back wall of, of, of gallery one, um, to a um, perhaps a thematization um, of, um, of the, of the continuity between canvas and country, uh, edgeless image and geographical expanse, uh, make of ways of making work and modes of inhabitation in the work of Katie West, which is to the left in the background of this installation shot. Um, Katie West's um, three um, textile works are not representations of country, but rather parts of it. One square meter canvases, which are dyed with vegetal, vegetal matter, Pinned or, pinned or folded to resemble clouds or mountainous landscapes. So they are metonyms of a territory and of its violent disposition, effecting, effected among other means through cartographic abstraction. The, the other arc um, connects Steve McQueen's reworking of the surrealist trope of the violated eye. Here, this is the eye of uh, actress Charlotte Rampling, which over the course of the film is repeatedly attacked probed and stroked by Steve McQueen's finger, so that Rampling is blinded to both the ocular assault and its visual registration as the camera refocuses on the scene, um, on a scene which is bathed in uh, the red glow of what might be a dark room where photographs are, are developed. I should say that this is an entirely subjective intertake on the, on, on, on the scene, it's, uh, it's not part of the, the apparatus, of the hermeneutic apparatus with which McQueen works, but they do um, speculate that the red light that bathed the scene might be the, the light under which photographs are, are developed. And this is an occasion for me to develop in a section of my exegesis, um, an attempt to rethink the metamorphosis as a combination of photosynthesis and photography. 
So Daphne becomes photosynthetic, which is um, an absorption of uh, the radiance of, of Apollo. She's fed by his glow and is able to resist him as a tree. She consumes a part and metabolizes a part of his power. But at the same time, this deflagration of light, which is quite present in of its narrative of uh, Apollo's passion, his burning with desire. Um, this light sets into motion, perhaps also a photographic process where the skin is encroached by bark, but it also becomes an assemblage of photographic plates which capture a distorted image of her surroundings. The scene happens in a forest and Daphne's history is first, the laurel tree. So there's a, a, a mimetic and anti-mimetic component to how this photographic image might be set to form um, within, within the forest. In both cases, photosynthetic and photographic triggered by um, Apollo's light. I have deviated, unfortunately, from the uh, from the story of the second of the second arc of, of Vertigo, which connects, as I mentioned, um, Steve McQueen um, film and this work, um, Hostages to the Future by Matthew Jones. Um, so there, there's on the, on the one hand the quite emphatic seeing nothing, then that uh, McQueen stages in his film, and the the sense of of seeing too much, of seeing seeing everything in, in Matthew Jones's work, uh, in his oblique engagement with the temporality and politics of May Gibbs's Snugglepot and Cuddle Pie, uh, as a world relation between present and future, as agglomerations, uh, agglomeration of portraits of Banksia man merging with the leafy backdrop, camouflaged within it, plotting once more the abduction of the child and the hijacking of the future. Um, a last point on, the, on this uh, intertwined trajectories of becoming image, uh, which perhaps mutedly in the exhibition and more explicitly in my exegesis, situate Daphne's transformation uh, in the Anthropocene uh, as a pre-post-humanism, as a preposterous figure, co-becoming with an unlivable, suffocating ground, perhaps not fundamentally unlike a bird whose wings are weighed down by the oily smudge that spews out from a toxic spill, covered in a film of pollutants, and thus becoming a film still. The meshing of figure and ground, the, the rearticulation of this crucial parameter of visual perception and narrative into the indistinction of a grounded figure is one of the operations in Nicholas Mangan's core correlation, correlations uh, with an intentional misspelling of correlation to suggest that a broken connection indicated in the title conjures coral, a significant material in the history of Daphnean representations. As you can see here in the in this um, in this work by Abraham Yamnitsa. Um, coral, a significant um, uh, significant material in the history of Daphnean representation uh, representations, but also a metric for the rising tides of climate change. Um, coral exists between biologies and states of matter. It is at once animal, plant, and stone. Uh, it twines animation and petrification. It is a mythological motif that is related to Medusa's monstrous powers, appearing when the Gorgon's head is thrown into the sea and her blood drips on seaweed, and it serves as an index for ecological emergencies. In Mangan's work, these trajectories converge into a metaphor for breath, where endangered coral colonies correspond to a collective sense of asphyxiation, when, where an analogy forms between the arborescence of coral and the anatomy of the bronchial system ramifying to oxygenate the lungs. So previously the largest, the largest living organism, the Great Barrier Reef is now the largest suffocating organism, a portent of thing to, things to come as much as, a, as an image of what has already come. The body abstracted in the work is unable to maintain its own homeostasis, a process of finding balance that seeps out of bodily confines and becomes a petrified relation to place, a shared last breath, a whispering of last wishes, not unlike Daphne's destroy this form addressed to her father. Both the figure and its support are made from fragments of coral jewelry or decoration, which were crushed and combined with a plaster to mix a mix to give it the appearance of terrazzo. The scene is situated between the abstraction of a fractured discontinuous metabolism and the figurative representation of a series of vital connections between environments and their symbiotic dwellers, which are here rendered as funeral, funeral markers as inert signs and as erasure.
that's my last image um, um an installation shot of, of, of gallery one um thank you so much for your attention I mean, sorry for that. Hi, sorry, but yeah, so I may have taken you by surprise by finishing yeah. um, <laughs> slightly earlier, but slightly more abruptly. Than, um, no, no, that was wonderful. Mentioned. Thank you. It was really um, very rich and detailed uh, reflection on the exhibition. And again, I've heard you speak about it several times, and each time is uh, slightly different, and you bring in different things. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, to start us off, we've got just a really great open question um, uh, that I guess is mainly more reflecting on your career overall. Um, and that is, what advice do you have for recently graduated curators or young curators um, based on your path? Um, I, it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's an extraordinarily site specific and, and context dependent um, um, activity curating I think it's a I mean I, I imagine it as a as a as a response to to an environment but it's also um, an economy that is conditioned by conditions that 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 is conditioned by a by an environment and its specificity so I wouldn't dare to make any recommendations to a, to a curator who's emerging onto the Australian scene um, at this time given the given the fact that I um, that my curatorial uh, preoccupations and um, um, and predispositions originate in such a in a dramatically different environment, which is um, the the Romanian art scene in the early two thousands. And then, as my project began to diversify um, Europe, as it was um, increasingly reunited after the the collapse of the Iron Curtain. I'm not shirking the question. I'm just I'm not I'm not circumventing it. I just realized that I would be unable because of a very specific uh, biographical experience and professional experience that I've had to give any any meaningful advice to somebody who's uh, becoming a curator um, here and now. Yeah, I think no, I think that makes <clears throat> perfect sense. The context has so much to do with who who you might work with and how you might work, and so yeah, that yeah. idea of overarching uh, like tools or kits that necessarily work for everyone. Obviously, you know, yeah, it's a difficult thing to to express. I think. Um, I'm quite interested because you have extensive experience curating outside of academia. Um, and just wondering if, I mean, I know you're still within your PhD, but if you can kind of reflect on the difference between working within an institutional, uh, within ac an academic institution as opposed to, you know, outside of it, um, away from uh, the structure of academic study. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the fact that the project is, um, that the exhibition at Aka is part of the PhD has not, in fact, created any, any meaningful or palpable difference in, in modus operandi. I wouldn't say that I have done anything differently because of the, the uh, academic perspective from which the show was made, perhaps, um, from, from projects that would be organized under different uh, circumstances or auspices. Um, of course, the, the task of, of communicating via an exegesis, the preoccupations that underpin the project is very, very different from uh, the requirements of, let's say, a regular exhibition guide or of a regular exhibition catalog. Uh, the depth of historical information is, is incomparable or needs to be incomparable, let's say. Not that the standards of, of, of historical accuracy in, in exhibitions of contemporary art uh, are lacking, or one thing is just that perhaps in our preoccupation with the contemporary, um, with that which emerges and that which is to come, um, some of the some of the prehistories, um, some of the first things before the first things um, become um, clouded, perhaps, or um, are are edited out. So um, it's certainly a more in depth exercise than than any other project that I have worked. On, with the possible exception of um, of allegory of the cave painting, the, the project that I mentioned 
uh, quickly in the in the beginning, and I do realize there's an element of perhaps almost uh, almost slapstick geographically making an exhibition about um, rock art in in Australia from Belgium, and then coming to Australia in order to make an exhibition about the Latin myth, of a Greek and a Greek myth rather than the Latin a Greek myth and its its um, Latin uh, retelling. Uh, but in this in this shifts um, and in into my my um, gradual immersion um, in the very stimulating intellectual environment at Monash, something quite unique in my experience has emerged. Uh, something of a hybrid project at, where I, I continue to behave um, as, as a curator, but just as a curator who has to respond to a very different set of standards um, of, um, of, academic, um, of academic research. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. Interesting. Uh, we've had another question pop up um, and they're asking, what is your next project? How do you see this research and exhibition expand further to future projects? Um, I don't. I don't have a next project. Um, to be to be perfectly honest, because this is far from from far from over. It's not just the exegesis that that needs to be completed, but it's also um, the. Um, I mentioned that Daphne is a, is an ekphrastic being, uh, um, a figure that forms as a permanent negotiation between text, text and image. Uh, so it probably makes sense that the exhibition at Aka will be followed by a reader, uh, by a book which extends some of the preoccupations and the, and the questions in the in the show in textual form. So this will be a an anthology that brings together hopefully 14 or 15 um, commissioned, newly commissioned essays and a couple of reprints, um, artist projects as well, artist pages um, made by artists, um, produced by artists in the, in the exhibition or not, artists who could not, because the because the project, as everything else, was co-curated by COVID, not all the, the artists were were that I had in mind initially were present finally in the in the exhibition. Um, so the the next step will be to extend the exhibition into into text and probably in in that in those textual reformulations of the project, the seeds of um, another exhibition will be will be found. Um, yeah. Mm, great. I love that idea of. Uh... COVID as a co-curator, so probably <laughs> yeah. a curator yeah. locally at the moment. Um, so we've got another question. Uh, bear with me a moment. So myths rely on telling and retelling. Do you see this exhibition as your final word on the myth, or will you explore and reinstall the myth in a different context? Uh, it's it's definitely one of the one of the thousands of shows that, that are possible on on the subject. I find it extraordinarily rich, and and this actually connects. Um, within the context of the, the 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 PhD connects, I guess this is this is part of the metabolism of any PhD. But it because there is a there is a moment in the life of a PhD project when it threatens to become, to it threatens to want to become a history of the world because at each at each corner you encounter another infinite subject such as the self or the place and the ways in which the limits between the self and the place have been drawn across centuries of philosophical and anthropological and environmental um, investigation. Um, this is absolutely, there's nothing final about the exhibition. Everything in it is provisional, not even, not even Daphne's tree is formed. So the myth is very much maintained in this interim or in, in this interregnum between, between corporeal templates and, and, and identities. And the last act of my, I'm going to, um, Reshare my screen for a second because actually the the last act um, of my my presentation was going to be a, a very brief reverie that connects um, works from the exhibition to works that are not in it. Um, So that this is a, a very important um, work in the show by by Jean Luc Moulin, which was um, coordinated remotely by um, by by the artist who, who lives in France and um, and fabricated uh, locally by the very amazing Sophie Takac, um, who invented a system where two garden sculptures, which we bought from Victorian from a store called Victorian Garden Ornaments were um, eroded, rubbed against one another um, until they produced a, 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 a conjoining, a hybridity where relationship of 
of aggression and sustenance of, of debilitation and consolidation could not be specified once and for all. And um, a situation where, again, relationships between figure and ground are, are perturbed, it might be said that these figures, these two figures, spiraled with one another in a shared groundlessness or exist one as the other's ground in, in, in a sense. And one of the images that, that in, in my conversations with, with Jean-Luc Moulin that led to the, to the realization of the work Rest Energy by Marina Abramovic and Dulai in the 1980s, which I have to reiterate is not in the show, but rather a part of the, kind of the mental process that led to the show. Uh, was an important thing. So at every at every juncture, the the show ramifies sometimes out of out of control, perhaps, and becomes other exhibitions, becomes other metamorphic sites, and other other possibilities. Um, a very significant work in the show is the stick developing eyes, where um, Lauren Burrow narrates the the, the metamorphosis of Val Routley into Val Plumwood. Um, this is possibly well known um, to those who participate to, to our conversation, but um, the remarkable philosopher Val Routley is attacked by a crocodile in Kakadu in the 90s, um, death row three times and emerges from this violent encounter as a transformed person, um, as, um, um, as, as one of Australia's most interesting um, Australia's most interesting environmental thinkers. So she abandons um, she abandons her philosophical pursuits that that drove her work initially and engages in a um, quite remarkable project of dismantling um, anthropocentrism, the notion that we are masters of the world. Um, and she writes from a position of being prey, of being another edible thing in the world. Uh, alongside other competing for competing for sustenance. Um, so the death roll, the centrifugal death roll of the crocodile, which is um, reproduced in a sense abstractly in the work by the fact that um, the, the figure in the in the backdrop, the, the, the literal sculpture in the backdrop was was made uh, through centrifugal casting uh, by by directing liquid aluminum to replicate the shapes of plumwood barks indicates the fact that Val Routley becomes Val Plumwood. So she she takes, as Daphne's name tra is transferred from, from the nymph to the tree, uh, Val Routley becomes Val Plumwood, adopting the name of the tree of the trees that grow around her new home in a forest in New, in new South Wales. Um, this is also a very significant uh, moment in the exhibition because it's the moment of stillness between the first and the last pictures, which I introduced before. It's the moment when the eyes of the crocodile begins to begin to peer from from these trays um, with um, institutional tap water, as Lauren Lauren calls it. Um, so it's it's the moment that uh, prefigures the attack, the moment of absolute stillness vibrating um, ominously. That, um, that that precedes the moment when the stick develop, develops not just eyes but also the mouth that grabs um, Val, Val Plumwood from her canoe. Um, and speaking to Lauren, this work, once again, not in the exhibition, John Collier's uh, Priestess of Delphi from, um, from the Art Gallery of South Australia in Adelaide um, is a remarkable is a remarkable thing. Um, Laurel, Laurel leaves exist in the in the show in, in actually the next work that I will show. But um, this is a remarkable um, iteration of the Laurel. Um, it was assumed for a very long time that the priestesses of Apollo, such as um, um, the ones at the at his temple in, in Delphi, would ingest um, or inhale um, the emanations of um, of Laurel leaves. So in a sense, the the woman, the priestess. Uh, be, ingests, metabolizes the tree that is Daphne in order to become the god, in order to become Apollo, to gain the gift of prognostication, of seeing into the future that, that the god has. So this is a very dramatic reversal of the metamorphic cycle that, um, that Daphne goes through. Um, it's been recently determined by, by Greek archaeologists that this is um, not the case, that it's a, it's a false assumption um, made in the classical period and that oleander, which is uh, psychotropically far more potent, was actually consumed at Apollo's 
um, Apollo's temples, as opposed to laurel, which is um, quite benign and which you use quite often in cuisine um, as bay leaves. Um, laurel reappears here um, in, in a work by Sanya Ivekovic, which is perhaps too long um, a story to introduce, but um, it's essentially a, a conversation between monuments and this, of course, connects to my starting point um, and the brief conversation about, about monuments in a post-communist context at the threshold between historical, historical epochs. Uh, essentially, in this work, Sanya Ivekovic uh, installs a monument, a second monument, which is, um, I don't think the resolution of Zoom permits um, the visibility of, of her model, which is a monument in Luxembourg, in the public space of Luxembourg, uh, called the Golden Lady, which um, in a sense quite emptily speaks about um, hero heroism uh, and the martyrdom of the Luxembourg population in the First World War. Um, Sonia's first proposal was that the, this monument is taken down from its from its um, obelisk and installed temporarily in a shelter for abused women. Um, the first proposal was was rejected because it was too controversial. Her second proposal was accepted, and her second proposal was a monument that is a one to one copy of the first one with um, significant exceptions. The figure that's holding out the laurel crown is now pregnant. Um, so in a sense, what was an, an empty um, mythological commemorative template has been filled with um, another body, in a sense, with a pregnant with a pregnant body, as it has been filled with a biography, because uh, the second monument is called Lady Rosa of Luxembourg. So there is an implicit dedication to the communist activist uh, Rosa Luxembourg, as opposed to the anonymous um, notion of mostly male um, heroism during the war. And um, another work that isn't in the exhibition is this quite extraordinary thinking further about vulnerable bodies and the way in which the ways in which they might become spaces and form and monumental forms. Um, in, we, I don't believe that the monument is a question of scale. I think it's a, it's a question of intensity and emphasis and, and, and historical considerations, rather a question of uh, magnitude. Um, this is in the house of my father by the British artist Donald Rodney, um, who was um, a remarkable artist, uh, a very important activist, and who unfortunately also suffered from sickle cell anemia. So this is a house that he makes from the dried skin that um, he sheds because of his because of his disease. So he's holding a little house, the house of his father, he says, in his hand that's made from his own shed skin. And in terms of Daphne's skin being covered in bark versus this um, skin that's in a sense lost, but then also recuperated as an image of, um, of an enclosure that might um, sustain a vulnerable body and that might defend the vulnerable identity. I think the parallel is quite striking. So th maybe this has been an overlong answer. It's just an attempt to suggest to suggest that each of the work, uh, each of the works in, in in the exhibition has a in a sense a spectral double elsewhere in the in the world, and the show could be endlessly remade and re narrated. Uh, metamorphosis is of course an infinite subject, but so is. Uh, the capacity of Daphne's myth, I believe, to be updated and extrapolated to present struggles and uh, tortured becomings. Amazing. So you could potentially fill the rest of your career with new... Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, this is... <laughs> <laughs> You've just figured it out. Um, uh, this is a, a really nice lead into the next question, um, because I think you demonstrated how to bring significance and meaning through storytelling um, and Im imparting information <clears throat> alongside the, the encounter with an image, in this case, just images. Um, so this person has said, thank you for your fascinating talk, Mikna. Can you speak about your stance on didactics? Do you feel that people should know the story of Daphne before seeing the exhibition? And I guess possibly the meaning of your many of the artworks as they encounter them as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's it's uh, it's an excellent question. Um, it's 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 actually been on on my mind quite a bit in in um, in the year that I spent um, putting together the the exhibition. The extent to which uh, Daphne needs to be 
perhaps permanently reasserted as the motif, uh, as the as the mental model of the exhibition. Um, I don't have a definitive answer in the, in a sense that that the answer that the exhibition itself formulates, in which I have tried to indicate to a certain extent by 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 saying that the show is bracketed quite literally between these this first and last images uh, that are taken from, from Daphne's myth, which we were extraordinarily lucky to be able to secure as loans from NGV and Art Gallery of New South Wales, respectively. So there is, there is a very clear sense of containment of all these other stories, and in two cases, two other myths. I'll get to those two cases in a second, um, within, within Daphne's myth. So, as I said, um, those those convulsed seconds that separate the flight and the metamorphosis are are stretched and amplified, um, expanded in order to contain the multiplicity um, and fragmentation, perhaps, of, of of the timelines on which the other works in the in the show exist. Um, I think the the didactic apparatus around the show offers. Um, the right amount of, of, of information um, so the show so that the, the exhibition becomes becomes comprehensible um i i don't think i don't think visitors are um burdened with superfluous information um in conversations with um with the team at, at Aka, i think the, the the amount of information and interpretation has been calibrated so that there is there is access, then there, there is transparency, uh, that there's nothing opaque or arcane about, about the exhibition, an exhibition that would be so deeply steeped into, um, into folds of, uh, of mythological exploration that would be inaccessible. Um, on the contrary, there's an attempt to suggest that the myth is, um, is very much, continues very much to unfold in, in, in the present, and that the question of violence against women and the question of the environment are the primary of the, of the degradation of the environment and Daphne's, Daphne's metamorphosis, which is precipitated by the fact that, of course, it's personified by a god, but essentially her milieu becomes unlivable. She cannot be there anymore, so she has to fly, not to, to, to flee not just out of her place, but out of herself in a way to escape it. Uh, so the tragedy of that, of that transformation uh, precipitated by violence uh, that seeps into the place in a way. Um, all these things are, are very much, I think, points of connection between the myth um, and, and, and the present. Um, the myth in its, in its presentness, the myth also encounters the presentness of two other old stories. And I'm very sorry that I don't have images of uh, Wingo Tinjima's uh, very brilliant, um, very beautiful painting of the Seven Sisters myth, which is very well known to, of course, to Australian audiences and which connects um, immediately through, um, through sexual violence and through, and through metamorphosis as, as women last women's last defense against the lawlessness of men, it connects to Daphne. Uh, there's also an interesting connection that forms between the um, human slash vegetal encounter in Daphne's myth and um, animal human encounters in Lauren Burroughs' work, which is immediately followed by another work that dramatizes quite quite strongly the eye, the retina, as a point of point of reflection and encounter between identities. Uh, this is uh, two or three tigers, a remarkable video installation by the Singaporean artist Ho Tzu Nian, which narrates um, a, a moment in in the Malay folklore, in the Malay imaginary. Uh, when colonialism intersects the the stories about the stories about the the imaginary of the were tiger, so the the werewolf is perhaps for from a European perspective a, a more uh, easily a more easily decipherable figure, but the were tiger haunts the Malay folklore um, as a as a co species as a as an ancestor and as a destination of becoming, in a sense. And the intersection between colonialism and this, this old story um, happens when, in the 19th century, a cartographic expedition led by a British explorer assisted by Malay convicts is attacked in the jungle uh, by a tiger, which leaps from, 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 from the forest, but quite strangely strikes at the theodolite, so the instrument of cartographic measurement, rather than rather than the human 
um, the, the human participants to the to the cartographic expedition. So in a way, the tiger identifies the theodolite as its true enemy, as the the abstraction of cartographic systems that will evacuate it from its from its territory. And this this connects, of course, again to to Katie West's uh, conversation about uh, maps and a country that is told within within narratives that are fundamentally resistant to the kind of um, word clarity that more that maps bring about. Amazing, thank you. <clears throat> um, another question: uh, Has there been any reception or feedback by the public or critics that have propelled your thinking to new ideas or facets of the myth and the myth in its exhibition form? Yes, absolutely. Um, and the best example is the most recent one. Uh, but truly remarkable review that was written by Paris Flatow for, for MIMO review, which I'm enormously grateful for. The show has been has been uh, surprisingly well for me, um, surprisingly well well reviewed. Um, Alka is of course a very prestigious place and and, and I'm, I'm very grateful for, for the fact that it was presented presented there. So this in itself has attracted a lot of attention, but there, there have been quite substantial responses um, to uh, to the exhibition. I warmly recommend to all those listening and all those interested, I warmly recommend Paris's review, which has, has come out a few days ago, which I'm still in the process of, of digesting and learning from. But there are quite a few interesting um, points, I think, uh, there that I need to, in a sense, I need to respond to um, mentally. Mentally, of course, I need to, to kind of uh, uh, understand his his propositions and and think about the show from the quite remarkable perspectives that he opens. Mm, fantastic. Um, I think we'll have one more question, and it's a, it's a good one to finish on because it's really about the intersection of the, I guess, your encounters with artists and and your uh, undertaking a PhD simultaneously. Um, and the phrase: Did you select the artist slash artwork um, to? I think that they're meaning to reflect the framing of your PhD, or did you work with the artist to create new work? I, I think they're talking about commissioning versus finding things and bring them into the frame of the exhibition. The, both both processes um, intertwine in the in the exhibition. Existing works um, have been have been selected, and in some cases, these are works that I have. Um, moderate that I'm moderately obsessed with works that have recurred in a number of uh, in a number of contexts and that continue to feed my thinking such as the um, quite quite astounding uh, auto portrait pending a work by the, the American artist June like it um, that is probably the third time that I exhibit this work and I find it's it's its potential uh, in not inextinguishable um, so in, in some cases, existing works were adapted to, to the, the economic conditions that we were faced with, such as the fact that, and I don't want to, to, to mention this as, um, as uh, an attenuating circumstance or extenuating circumstance, I'm sorry, but uh, the price of, because of COVID, the price of, of shipments um, doubled or tripled, uh, if not quadrupled in, in, in some cases, because so few planes um, so few planes come into Australia that that everything cargo becomes far and freight becomes far, far more expensive affair. So there was a, a lot of work um, of imagination and improvisation that was done around those um, those those limits. <clears throat> there were conversations that that have resulted in in um, in newly commissioned artworks and uh, attempts to revisit existing projects such as a, a very significant uh, work by by Sanya Ivekovic, the one that I have I have just shared, which has had um, and it's had enormous visibility at least at least in Europe to revisit it from from this perspective, and it was uh, quite a rich dialogue with. Um, with Sanya, for whom, of course, the political dimension is very important, but she she was she absolutely agreed that from the vantage point of Daphne Smith, um, that potential is is reactualized rather than diminished. Mm, fantastic, um, and that's actually an artist you work with to change kind of change the form of the artwork for the presentation of the exhibition. Is that correct? In the yeah yeah the uh, book became a wallpaper. I, I guess this is what you're talking about. Um, a book became a wallpaper and it's um it's the plant collection where the Dutch artist Inge Meyer looks at a um, 
rather idiosyncratic um, episodes um, in the um, in the life of the Stedelijk Museum, the Municipal Museum of Contemporary Modern and Contemporary Art in Amsterdam, whose um, director between the 40s and the 70s, if I remember correctly, Willem Sandberg, um, arguing that art and plant life have the same are synergic, perhaps, and have the same capacity to rejuvenate and to the same elan vital, the same uh, impetus towards uh, self-actualization. Uh, Willem Sandberg decided to exhibit plants together with art artworks. This started with a very unusual pairing of a pit Mondrian boogie woogie and the Swiss cheese plant. This was his inaugural gesture. But then this led to the creation of a um, of a plant collection alongside the collection of uh, modern art um, at the museum and the plant curator, of course, somebody who attended to, to the plants and somebody who considered the relationships or the symbiosis perhaps between the forms um, in the in the artworks and the shapes of, uh, of plants. Um, the, the project existed, the project which brings together archival photographs of this um, of this moment and, and practice which by today's museological standards would be absolutely unacceptable. We know that humidity is the greatest uh, danger to artworks. Uh, we know that plants tend to uh, create their own weather um, and um, manifest all sorts of chemical potentials, which would be considered sacrilege um, in the places where um, visual heritage is uh, is conserved today. So this um, there's a, a collection of extraordinary photographs that um, that Inge has collected the document this um, this period, um, and it's it's a very transfixing exercise to go through them because you are one is increasingly oblivious to the art and the 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 strange parasitical presence of the plant becomes becomes so hypnotic that you don't even you 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 lose sight of what exhibition you're in and you just focus on the plant over and over again, um, and it's it's seeming re-emergence. Um, the project existed as a book. I've said this before, it's become a wallpaper where this um, trompe l'oeil uh, effect of the plants uh, inhabiting the inhabiting the gallery is actually manifested on a on a almost monumental scale, perhaps at this, the size of the wall. Uh, Petaka, those images become acquire a kind of a presence um, that is uh, that is quite remarkable. Mm, wonderful. Thank you. And on that note, I can't help but notice you seem to be uh, actualizing that approach with your research materials behind you on your screen this evening. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> As a practice, think, thinking in practice. Um, okay. Thank you very much. I think we'll leave it there. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you so much, Andrew. And thanks, everyone, for your attention. Oh, it was, it was wonderful. Really wonderful to hear from you. And thank you, everyone, for your questions and for attending uh, tonight's event. As we mentioned, this will be a video that will be available on ACCA's website. So you can revisit um, the video later if you want to unpack further some of those ideas and um, jump back and forward if you will. Um, but say good night from uh, ACCA, uh, where I am, and good night to you, Mick, now. And, um, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night.